With 2016 drawing to a close now, I'm going to take a look at the top 10 security blunders in Linux. And there's been quite a few, but uh, these are 10 of my favourite ones. So you might be sat there on your Linux PC, looking around on the internet, probably not that interesting gaming, definitely not that interesting gaming from the 1990s. So why would you be worried about an exploit with the libgme, the game music emulator? Well, it turns out it's pre-installed on your PC, as part of GStreamer. And attempting to remove it breaks GStreamer, as well as most of your desktop. Now this exploit was dealt with professionally, it was found by a researcher, passed on to the application maintainers, the issue was fixed, update was rolled out, and then a proof of concept exploit was released. It's only because of the stupidity of the whole thing that I've decided to put this in the top 10 list. The exploit involves a malicious Super Nintendo sound file .spc, which can be renamed to a .flac, a feature of GStreamer is that it interprets what the file actually is and opens up the relevant library, and therefore you can be infected from a sound file <laughs> that looks like a FLAC but is actually a Super Nintendo sound file. Great. In ninth place, the Linux Mint website was hacked and the link for downloading the ISO file was diverted to a malicious site, and this alternative file came preloaded with nice malware. Oh great. Fortunately, the issue was spotted within a few days and the website was cleaned up and the link corrected. In 8th place, the Ubuntu forums were hacked for a second time, and the details of nearly 2 million users were released. Of course, it pales into insignificance against the Yahoo, LinkedIn and MySpace data breaches which occurred this year. Turns out the Canonical team were a bit behind on patching the updates for the forum software, and a SQL injection was used. Yes, a SQL injection from the 1990s was used to extract all the information. Well, okay, not a specific SQL exploit from the 90s, but the concept has been around for quite a while. In seventh place, proving that Linux is getting more and more popular, there was a ransomware exploit released. Now, this predominantly targeted servers, specifically servers with the Redis database. Now, there was actually a case of it being found in the wild, and uh, I'm not sure whether the Site maintainers actually paid up, but yeah, it would encrypt a web server and demand a payment of two bitcoins to release the files. In the sixth place, proving that antivirus is a waste of time, Google's Travis Ormandy had notified McAfee of a vulnerability within their enterprise Linux client, and McAfee sat on it for, well, it appears to be about six months before finally releasing an update. Well done to McAfee. Now, it did take multiple vulnerabilities for an exploit to actually happen, but I love the quote there. So it's kind of like how a light bulb that sets things on fire is still high quality as long as you only measure lumens. Yeah, protection from McAfee, great. In fifth place, the Chinese arm vendor, Allwinner, had left a backdoor exploit in the kernel. All it needed was the text, root my device, <laughs> and it would allow root access. Well done there, marvellous. So the backdoor code may have inadvertently been left in the kernel after developers completed debugging, but the company has been less than transparent about it. So the code is mainly used in Android tablets, set-top boxes, ARM-based PCs, and also the Orange Pi and Banana Pi micro PCs. In fourth place, I get to poke fun at antivirus checkers yet again with Symantec this time around, and it was Google's Travis Ormandy who also discovered this exploit. This one is uh, even simpler than the McAfee exploit, because all you need to do is just email a file to a victim for the exploit to work. Now I didn't say anything about opening it, I just said email the file. So if you use an early version of a compression tool to squeeze executables, you can trigger a memory buffer overflow that gives you root level control over a system. The kickers are that it is both easy to launch the exploit and particularly vicious. In most cases, as Semantic is intercepting system input and output, you only need to email the file. The victim doesn't even need to read the email. Just the act of AV scanning is a trigger. Or send a web link to wreck someone's day. In third place, KD Neon was found to have incorrectly configured the package archives, allowing anyone to upload packages to it. And their recommended solution? For extra security, reinstall KDE Neon from a freshly built ISO file. Oh dear. Now the trouble is they don't know if the package archives were actually tampered with or not. I suppose it's unfortunate they were either missing the log files or don't have the expertise within the team. 
So we have an unknown situation. Were the archives actually tampered with? Was malware served up in any packages? We don't know. And that's why I've put this so high up on the list. And especially because it caused me the annoyance of having to reinstall. In second place, we have the Linux kernel exploit Dirty Cow, the Dirty Copy on Write. An exploit that had been around since 2007 and that Linus himself had tried to fix early on. There's quite a lot of spiel about how the exploit actually works, but the basics are it involves a race condition that if triggered correctly allows you to gain root level privileges on the system. Turns out it's uh, rather easy to exploit and uh, unfortunately because of the lack of updates on Android phones in particular, they do remain rather vulnerable. For desktop and server based installs of Linux, the patches have been released. It just happens to be the Android phones that are worst off in this uh, situation. And in first place, we have the Internet of Things, the Internet of Tat, the Internet of utter garbage that more time was spent on marketing it than writing decent security software for it. Because it led to the rise of the Mirai botnet. A botnet that became so strong, just being utilised on basic internet cameras and internet digital video recorders, that it was able to attack the Krebs on Security website at a rate of 620 gigabits per second and the French web host OVH at over 1 terabit per second, the largest scale distributed denial of service attack seen to date. So how bad is it to expose a DVR to an internet connection? Well, this article goes through exactly what happened to it. So the initial concern was how long would it take for the device to be attacked and the sad part is it didn't have to wait long. The IP address was hit by Telnet attempts pretty much every minute. Instead of having to wait for a long time to see an attack, the problem was the DVR was often overwhelmed by attacks and the Telnet server stopped responding and it had to be rebooted every few minutes. Oh, if that's not a colossal failure, I don't know what is. So that was a look at my top 10 favourite security blunders of 2016. Now I know there were quite a few more, but uh, interestingly most of them only came out at the end of the year. The beginning of the year was very quiet. So what were your favourite security blunders of the year? Now I suppose we can only hope that things get quieter from now on. I would like it to be, but uh, who knows what 2017 will bring. But thanks for watching, see you all later.